I've sort of made a mantra out of what I eventually actually branded as mistake-based marketing. In other words, learning rapidly, making mistakes, learning rapidly from it. And I think that's the only way these days to actually adapt to what's happening in the world, which is constantly changing, right? So for me, uh, what helped me at first was that I was raised, my dad was an itinerant um, Procter & Gamble CEO. And so uh, I was born in Canada, was raised in the Caribbean, and then did most of my schooling in the, the French system. And as a result, I think that, first of all, I have no friends from the school days. I just basically, I don't have a home. And I think it made me more of, um, gave me more of a 30,000 foot view and more adaptability. So, um, and then after, after school, I went into, into the nonprofit space for about 10 years. And there's something about making, you know, $10 a week and um, just working on fabulous things that is, um, of course, doesn't set you up to pay for a mortgage, but it does, it's the pure straight shot of, you know, doing good things for the world. Um, eventually, though, I started thinking that, you know, um, technology was going to really transform the world. And that's when I finally landed uh, in New York City in the 80s, uh, built a, an IT company that I later um, gave away. And that was a whole story all, by, all of its own. <laughs> but really when I came into my own was with the dot-com because the dot-com was like – Rapid change, um, rapid liquidities. You know, one was five months, the other one was four months, and then another one I think was six months. It was constantly um, just this ferment, right? It was like a big popcorn popper. Um, kind of got spoiled by that. Um, and the reason is that typically software and high tech have no mass. You know, you're, you're not trying to build brick and mortar. So things happen quickly. It's all about uh, adoption, what Microsoft calls attachment. You know, do people stick to something? And that is much easier to do than actually building um, big things. Now, when I finally decided I could become a CEO and somebody actually took me up on it, which was the worst day of my life, um, that's when I learned, because of the space I went into, that things do move slower, but you still got to make change happen. And that's what I've been struggling with in the last 10 years. So growing up with your dad being a CEO, did you feel like you knew from an early age that that's kind of the line you wanted to go down? Uh, and then like, you know, I'm also curious that kind of compare and contrast, like what you thought when you, when you're watching him and then what you saw in reality, like had you romanticized the role a little more than maybe what it really was? Yeah. Well, he was John Hamm, Mad Max, uh, you know, um, Mad Men. I mean, he was that guy, including all the promiscuity and, and crazy stuff. And, <laughs> and um, what's weird is that, I, during my period of working in a nonprofit, I actually became a merchant mariner and I went off to sea for many years and came back and my dad hugged me and I was like, what? He'd never done that. I mean, he was not a hugger and, um, it's kind of shocked me. So growing up in that fifties, early sixties world was very different from what we expect today. Uh, so there's that number one, number two, I never really understood what he was doing. Uh, and he said, Riggs, you'd make a great lawyer. I'm like, I don't even know why you're saying that, right? Um, <laughs> I guess because he thought I was logical. Yeah, love to read. I was I had my nose in a book all the time, which I think is the best formation you can have for a living is just read, read, read nonstop. Um, but I actually decided while I was in, in school in the States that I wanted to do film and actually got myself you know, invited to New York University Film School about the same time that Martin Scorsese was there. Ultimately turned away from that. I did eventually do film later. But I I felt that I was basically able to do whatever I want. And that really, you know, I remember my mom telling me when I was like nine that, Riggs, your dad makes 40000 a year. And that was a lot of money back then. That was a, probably a million dollars today. Um, so we essentially had, you know, hot and cold running servants and chauffeurs and this and that. So I felt that I could just choose what I wanted. And so at what point in this journey, it sounds like you had the nonprofit, you were a mariner. I think I read that you did crew. At what point did you kind of just fall in love with water? That's an interesting story because when I, so I, post 2000s, when I really felt that I blossomed because a lot of the dra the dreck that, that occurred in the late nineties with com had been swept away. And I was able to work on great projects such as 
uh, selling yellowpages.com. And then eventually I got to be the number two in a company that we got to the NASDAQ. Um, and while I was in that company, I realized it had the seeds of its own destruction. It was, they, they, there was a company that had, that had made a lot of money doing rather shady practices. You know, the kind of, the kind of thing that all of a sudden you get a flash on your screen, like you have malware and they'd actually injected the malware. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I came along when they said, Riggs, we want to clean up our act. We have new technology. And, but I started realizing that they were not going to – that the tiger wasn't going to change its stripes. And so that's when I realized I needed to move on. I spoke to a fund at the time that I interacted with, and I said, I'd love to be a CEO. I think I'm ready. And they said, not a problem, Riggs, but you know what? We're doing green. We're not doing tech anymore. And – what we think is the next big thing is algae for biofuels. And so we, I'm, I have a brother who was super cool, super inventive, and he had a tech that we could um, employ to, to add some value in this, in this space. And we had a wonderful run for, uh, you know, about five, six years where we just had so much fun. Um, and I was on all the big shows, you know, it's like who to, who to thunk, you know, algae, uh, but the oil industry innovated too, and they innovated with fracking, and which drove the price of fuel down below fifty dollars. At which point, algae became a science experiment, and we had to figure out what we were going to do, uh, because being a public company, I had a duty. And we, one of the good people in our in my company, Bill Charneski, had this bright idea: like, well, we can extract algae from the water. Why don't we just extra extract sewage from water? And it seemed like a bright idea, and we went went with it. And so, starting in about 2014, we entered the water space as a pivot, as a got to do something, got to add some value somewhere. Um, what I learned immediately was it was like stepping into molasses. You know, <laughs> algae was like that. You know, it was inventive. It was all brand new. There was no legacy industry there. Uh, with water, there's a lot there. It's trillions of dollars of of assets under management. It itself is a trillion dollar in the industry worldwide and lots of set practices. It takes 12 to 15 years to get a new technology adopted, things like that. Um, and I found also that people think water is very important, but they really don't want to discuss sewage. That's just not their thing. They're like, yeah, that's that concrete thing down by the West side that does something with the water and it's all good. And, the water industry has conspired with that by basically saying, don't worry, it's all good. Just flush the toilet and it all goes away. Well, under the covers, there's a lot of trouble with the water industry, um, mainly because of dramatic underfunding by the federal government. And even now with the Biden, you know, multi-trillion dollar um, uh, infrastructure bill, water got $55 billion, which is less than one year's catch up on their own um, deficit. So um, very neglected space, but yet a lot of complacency and a lot of um, refusal to change reminds me a lot of the taxi industry pre-Uber, right? Where they're like, no, this is how we do it. And, you know, <laughs> we're going to be nasty to you on the phone. That's how we do it, that kind of stuff. And um, I really, with my team, we were working hard to figure out how to crack that nut. And eventually we started to work it out. And when you decided to pivot into water, when you started, what did you see as kind of your addressable market or your like uh, ideal customer? Like, who were you targeting at this point? Well, we started by addressing the fracking space, right? It's like, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. And so we were going to clean up frack water, and we came up with the technology. And we were – this was before the price of crude had really crashed. And so I remember that we, we, we had a deal that was just cooking with um, the state – um, oil company in Oman, for example, and various other deals. And we, we had a traveling road show that was going all over, um, um, for example, the Western Shale in Colorado. And all these things were happening. And then the price of crude really took a dive. And what happens then is when, when things go south in the oil industry, they shut everything down. They stop everything. They just hibernate. And they live off what they can live off. They, they close a bunch of wells. They don't do any innovation. And that took a long time for them to cycle out of. And uh, by then, of course, we had realized that we needed to 
further broaden. And that's when we said, you know what, let's take this tank and go into industrial water treatment. Um, by then, we were also realizing that a pure technology licensing play was going to run into this problem of the decade-plus acceptance problem. And being a small public company, we didn't have the means to just fund the lab for 10, 12, 15 years. And so that's when we realized we needed to do something more. And we started to um, do different things, most of which has, have survived as, um, as business units that today we're now mo monetizing. So all our many attempts, most of them, most of them did well. One specifically did not, which I can get into, which was the crypto. Um, but most of it actually turned into something really good. Um, but I have to say that we were not happy with organic growth in the water industry because, you know, a water company expects to make 10, 15% growth per year, and that's just not enough. Um, and that's what we were experiencing. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is not going to work out very well. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, that's when a lot of us had to reassess what we were doing. You know, what are you going to do when you grow up? Because it was kind of this moment of reckoning. Um, a lot of investors freaked out. I remember clearly the first week of February when, when markets started tanking because price of crude dropped, um, because Wuhan demand had evaporated. And we went, oh, Lord, there's something going on here. And that's when we got into high gear to figure out how come organic growth is so slow and what can we do about it. And this led to the realization, hey, it's the money, stupid. If you can solve the capital problem in water, then things become much more frictionless. And that led to adopting water as a service, which we, we branded as a thing called water on demand. So as a layperson who's not a water expert, who are like the players in this market that you're competing against? So again, from my layperson's point of view, there's like water companies that are charging you for your showers and, you know, washing machines and you get a water bill every quarter or every month. Then there's like bottled water companies that ha seem to have a monopoly. A couple of companies have a monopoly on just like bottled water, especially in really impoverished places around the world. So Riggs, what, what are the players in the market that you were trying to, you know, have an impact against? Okay, so we got Big Water, which is people like Veolia, American Water Works, Evoqua, and these people live off of the municipal bond market. In other words, funding the big central systems, and even though it's underfunded, it's still many billions of dollars. And uh, American Water Works has um, their, their, their acquisition budget every year alone is a billion dollars just for acquisitions every year. So they... And that's how they grow. I mentioned 10, 15% is not fast enough. Well, American Water Works and all the other guys grow by simply you know, buying companies that have managed to become $100 million companies. So there's that space, which obviously we're not going to compete with. And then what we started seeing starting in 2016 was a clear um, trend towards decentralized water treatment, coming from the fact that there'd been a there's a growing failure of central water systems. Um, not, it, it, there's good research that shows that it's now running about $75 billion of unfunded infrastructure every single year, and it adds, 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 adds. And as a result, you have these disasters like Flint, problems in Fort Lauderdale, South Bend, um, uh, Compton, a bunch of places. The, these are just the, the canaries in the coal mine. There's a ton of trouble all over America um, with water systems. And um, the consumer is generally unaware of it because, hey, they still flush the toilet and it goes away. Um, but you, businesses are being asked more and more, like, you need to treat your own water. We can't handle your dirty water. Um, send it. Uh, send us treated water. So as a result, you've got a brewery. Uh, there's been some very interesting experiences that breweries have had because <clears throat> when a brewery grows – they have a lot of output of effluent. It's not very toxic, but it's a lot of water. And they overwhelm systems when they start growing. And one particular brewery on the, in the East Bay in uh, San Francisco was literally trucking half of its effluent to another county so it, would, it could do it somewhere. And so they became a candidate to do their own water treatment. This has been a growing trend. It's now a thing. 
it's accepted that um, many, many businesses and communities, human communities like, like uh, housing developments, want or need to do their own water treatment. In the case of housing developments, it's an opportunity for the developer to not have to pay the, for the sewage connection, which can be several million dollars. So there's benefits to being detached. Um, there's also a requirement. The, the, the water industry, as opposed to the energy industry, is not fighting decentralization. They welcome it, and in many cases, they mandate it. So that's a thing. So now that meant that all of a sudden, small water companies all over America are starting to become bigger water companies because they're the, the local um, you know, guy with the ladder truck becomes an important person and that you have a lot of growth of these regional water companies. And that's the space we ended up in. We bought one of those companies in 2015. We built one of those in 2018 uh, with a cool modular technology. And so that's the space we ended up in is being in the decentralized space which um, obviously has a ton of players. Now, what's our differentiation? First one that we developed starting in 2018 was this water system in a box concept. You know, ship it out, drop it, in a, drop it in the ground, plug it in, and you can also mass produce it because, believe it or not, the water industry still thing, does things by hand, customized, etc. So that was one. But it's okay. It's a good differentiator, but um, it's a slow growth kind of thing. The big one here is this water as a service. Now, water as a service is nothing new in the water industry. Uh, they call it DBOO, design, build, own, operate. Well known. It tends to be for the largest systems. What, the company that actually trademarked the term water as a service is a company called Seven Seas, and um, they, they supply desalination plants to entire islands and they put people on the meter. So they act as a kind of a private utility. Um, but these are big systems, the multi-million dollar systems, and that's how they're set up. Um, so we compete with those people, but not at, the, at that scale. We're, we're in the smaller uh, local business marketplace. In that, there, are, there is a, a few, for example, there's a very good competitor we have called Cambrian Innovation, which is on the East Coast, but most of their work is in the California area with wine, with a beverage industry like, like uh, wine and beer and so forth. And they do a great job. We think we have certain differentiators, which I'll be able to get into, but it's a growing marketplace, which is the local business having to cope with being in the water business, which they never planned to be. When you're making beer, all you want to spend money on is beer making. You don't want to be fix, fixing water. And so these people end up against their will, and we have a solution. And when you're talking about decentralized setups, especially, you know, you mentioned like a, a housing development, and I think that'd be more relevant to listeners, you know, a residential property that's on one of these mm -hmm. systems. Is this only impacting water that's going out, uh, or is it including the water that you're drinking and coming in? And if it's going out, is there any reason why the individual homeowner cares? Right. So there's three phases. The first phase is the incoming water, which um, will need to be purified. Even if it comes from the city, typically the water is just the water quality typically meets federal standards, but federal standards are way too lax. So you and I know that we better have at least a, a Brita pitcher on our, on our kitchen counter, the very least, because the water is not great. It's not going to kill you right away, but it has, you know, forever chemicals. It has even uranium, all kinds of crazy things. So the incoming water needs to be handled. Then the what in a residential system is called a black water, the poop, um, needs to be uh, separated. So typically you'll have um, – because we're moving away from septic tanks. Um, the FHA has very stringent requirements for financing septic tanks, and the whole idea is to get away from them. They, they are problematic in many ways. And so what you have instead is one of these closed-circuit um, – it's called a sewage skim system, which basically, you know, skims the sewage off, puts it in a sludge tank, and every six months a truck comes along and pumps it up. And now you have water. Now, typically people don't have appetite for drinking that water, even though it can be treated to that level. So it's used to irrigate golf course, um, lawns, or just recharge the groundwater. The third phase is um, recycling. Um, you can take the gray water 
and you can use that. But also, more importantly, any water that you treat, you've usually paid something for that water. Even if you were pulling it out of the ground, you still had to pay money to treat it and so forth. You might as well get more than one turn out of it. And this is very true in California. I know people in L.A. that are spending twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month on their water bill, and that's a home. What? It's crazy because there's, there's uh, punitive levels that, that kick in. I had a home in, um, in, in Los Angeles, and I had a quarter acre that I was irrigating, and my water bill was $800 a month. It was like, what? Um, and it was not that much. It was, it was a lot of desert plans. I was like, how can it be that much? So um, it really pays to be able to reuse your water. America um, does a very poor job of recycling. There's a reason for that. Uh, if you compare it, for example, Israel has almost 90% recycling. The second in the world is Spain with 20%. America, 1%. The reason is very simple. We have we built our water systems a long time ago when it was just one direction. It comes from the mountains, we use it, and then we dump it to the rivers, treat it, but it's not going to come back uphill. And so we're kind of stuck with that system. The solution is, hey, decentralization, you're treating your own water, you can reuse your own water, thus save money, also help with the drought problems because you're getting more than one turn out of that water. And so it's a legitimate solution. Long story short, a housing development, a, a developer can plan on plunking down a housing development without worrying about a sewage connection. Uh, they can get their water piped in from the city, but if that's a the problem, they just get it from a well. Um, and then, of course, they can do their own irrigation, etc. And these days... You know, the preppers were right. We needed to be ready for anything. And sure enough, I think any housing development worth its salt is going to have a produce garden in the future. And you'll be able to water that with your water, too. So I think looking at um, this, this um, we're seeing this show up in our operations. We're seeing um, detached communities show up on our radar as wanting systems like this. And it's, it's a, it is a trend. Migration from the primary cities to the secondary cities. I'm in Clearwater, Florida. I moved from Los Angeles. That's exactly what people are doing. Um, and, you know, this is a suburb of Tampa. And even Tampa is, relatively speaking, a secondary city. So movement to the, to the secondary cities, uh, first of all, overtaxes the local water systems, which are not accustomed to this kind of level. And uh, secondly, there's a dearth of available properties, um, and sewage connections become a thing. So that's more and more becoming a business. These self-contained human communities, they're going to have their own energy they, as much as they can. They're going to have their own water, clean water, treated water, reused water, and they're going to have eventually, I think, their own food. I think it's very wise to invest in that kind of community. So going back to the insane prices that you were just quoting from California, and I read that water's inflating at, I think it was three times the rate of normal inflation. Is the reason for that, is it overpopulation? Are we just using more water than we have in the past? Or they, like, what's contributing to a 300% increase over the regular inflation rate? Well, part of the problem is that um, the high point of federal funding for, what, for municipal water systems was in the 70s um, when it was roughly $7.6 billion a year, which even that's not a lot, but it was better than nothing. And over the years, it's gone down to almost nothing. And even that almost nothing is loans and not grants. So federal support for water systems has disappeared. Meanwhile, environmental um, standards have risen. There's more and more dramatically uh, demanding, like get more arsenic out of your water, get the fluorine out of the water, et cetera. All really needed, but it adds to the cost of that municipality. And then that municipality has a problem. Um, a few years ago, when Compton residents in California saw brown water coming out of their faucet, they said, what's going on? And the local water district said, well, we've been asking for money for a decade now, and, the, and your city council never allocated the money. And, and by the way, that water not, is not, won't hurt you. It's just magnesium. So good luck. Well, <laughs> that water district got you know, closed down and taken over by the city of L.A. But the, but the bigger picture is there's a lot of um, funding problems. And so uh, municipal water districts, 
Uh, for example, Austin. Austin's seen a tremendous rise. Why? Lots of in-migration, lots of pressure on the water system. They're trying to fund it somehow. The water rates go up, and they're relatively unregulated. There's, there's actually a lot of freedom to raise water rates. You'd think they wouldn't be, but there are. And so one of the good things about water as a service is that a housing development, an, an HOA, or a business like a brewery can enter a long-term contract for water by the gallon that limits the amount of inflation that there can be and includes all of the maintenance, all built in. And it's a very sane decision because it locks out the, um, the imponderable, right? It says, okay, this thing is set. It's going to rise at a certain CPI index, um, and it's going to be fully taken care of, and now we can move on to other problems. That makes it very a very popular idea. And for these systems, I know we've we've mostly talked about larger use cases. Are you also with one of your companies or acquisitions or, or what you currently have looking at anything where whether it be somebody who's off the grid or they just live in a house that they want this kind of setup and their community doesn't have it yet? And so it's like a literally for one house. Can you do that? It's possible. The problem is that um, it's a mass market and, you know, the ticket is very low for us. So. Already, we are dropping down from the very large to the, let's say, the size system we're dealing with is $500,000 to $2 million. That's already a challenge to make good margins from, et cetera. Dropping further, uh, like, a, you know, you can buy a, a black water recycling system from Fuji Water, a very good system for, I don't know, $12,000. Um, we're just not able, we're not Fuji Water. We're not that kind of industrial conglomerate that can that can build, you know, at that scale and um, industrialize like that. So we've chosen to stay out of the single-family marketplace. That's why we're happy to work with a 200-door housing development, for example. That's, that's kind of our, our, our sweet spot at this point. Well, I'm sure as time goes on, things are going to just get more affordable as technology starts to advance. And I'm sure, you know, in the next decade or so, we're going to start to see a lot more of those maybe single-house systems. I'm curious, though, you mentioned all of the funding dried up from the municipalities and the government just seems to not care about water whatsoever. But I've seen more than ever recently, probably in the past decade, that you know just regular people are starting to invest back into water. They want clean water. They want you know renewable energy. So how are people actually going about doing this? Right. So the <clears throat> we had a realization when we, when we figured out that we needed to solve the that, that we could accelerate the adoption of, of good decentralized water systems, <clears throat> that what would really make it work would be to get rid of the capital problem. Sign here, you get your system. It's not your property, it's ours, and it's basically you're paying for use. And that is a very attractive thing because people don't mind operating expenses uh, versus capital expense, typically, especially since most uh, businesses have not, really uh, planned for a big capital expense in water treatment. That wasn't on their business plan. So we solved that problem, and uh, it, takes, it takes the problem away. Now, we then realized, wait a minute, we're very good at raising money from regular investors. This is what we do. It's how we've paid for our development all these years. It's, um, there's, no, there's no secret that we've chosen to have a burn as opposed to living uh, as a small water company in McKinney, Texas, we've chosen to kind of try try bigger. And so we raise money for that, and we're good at that. And we have a, a bench of really, really loyal investors who, who've done well with us and who are, who are willing to look at, you know, helping us along. And we realize, wait a minute, we're good at doing this. Let's let the ordinary investor invest in water systems. And the structure is very similar to what the oil industry calls master limited partnerships, which is a ba uh, basket of, of energy properties, pipeline, oil, and, ga and natural gas production. And that, that basket of, of assets generates uh, royalties. And so you and I can it, – it's, it's, a, it's a sophisticated investment, but we're free to invest in, a, in an MLP um, – there's about 60-some MLPs, uh, and it's a big market, about $300 billion value, and it complements big oil. It doesn't, it doesn't take it away. It, it's, a, it's an alternative, alternative source 
of innovation, of financing, et cetera. We adopted that idea by creating this water-on-demand capital and letting people invest directly in it, um, and thus all of a sudden it's no longer just a you know, high-risk micro-cap investment, you know, high-risk, high-reward. It's actually, you know, to a great degree, an asset, a productive asset. And not only that, it's as opposed to precious metals and oil and gas and real estate, it hasn't had a big run yet. Why? Because people have not been able to invest in water systems except by getting a, um, you know, an exchange-traded exchange fund or uh, buying shares in Veolia. There's been no direct investment in the asset, and that is a first. And we believe we're, we're you know, really um, pioneering new ground. You've talked about water as a service, and you've also talked about the struggles that some of the cities are having. Are there any federal regulations that stops the city of Austin from coming to you and saying, we want you to handle the whole city. We'll work out a contract for water as a service. We don't want to have to deal with it as a city. Well, <clears throat> we already have, in our conventional business, we already have small cities. Uh, it's it's uh, becoming more and more commonplace because the water industry uh, has another problem, which is, they're aging out. It's called the silver tsunami. And there's a, about 3 million jobs that are becoming, um, uh, that are becoming uh, deficient this decade. And so increasingly, they're, they're saying to private water companies, you take over the whole operating contract. So that is already happening. Now, moving to the next stage, which is getting rid of the capital requirement, is not something that we're getting into because it's a very big ticket. I'd rather have, you know, 500 businesses for whom we're doing the water work uh, instead of, you know, five big cities. It's, it more, it's easier to do. It's more scalable. Um, I prefer working with businesses. One of the problems with the water industry is the big companies have it all locked up. So, sure, I'm going to go to the city of Austin and I'm going to try and bid for an operating contract. And then Veolia is just going to come in and take the contract. And it's just, it happens so much that companies at our scale just go, you know what? You take the big stuff. <laughs> That's what you own. There's, um, you know, Clayton Christensen was a wonderful um, technical uh, writer who um, he wrote a book called, um, you know, The Innovator's Dilemma. And what he uh, saw was that innovation comes from within the, the legacy Systems are the legacy. He, he took the disk drive industry as his example. And as it got smaller and smaller and smaller, he, the seeds of the next generation were born in the, in the existing player, were suppressed because it would have meant reducing their sales. So like, no way. We're not going down that road. Those people then left and destroyed the incumbent disk drive company. And this happened again and again and again and again. Um, and so that's what I think is I'd, I'd much rather be able to innovate in the smaller form factor, as it's called, the smaller size, and, um, and really the growth is in decentralization as opposed to the big uh, lumbering and um, fully uh, owned you know, uh, municipal market. So I love the idea of trying to get to be like in Israel where they had, what was it, like 90% recycled water or something? Was that right, Riggs? Almost 90%, yes. That's insane. But yes. So from, you know, a brewery or a large apartment building or any of these smaller players that you're targeting, like, how do you get them on board? Is it just such an astronomical cost savings that it's a no brainer for them? Or, you know, what's the, what's the marketing tactic to you know, start to actually get that percentage up of recycled water? Well, that's a really good question because you have to get them early enough. If they finally solve the capital problem at that point, you're just bidding for their capital job. And we have a lot of those are... Our sales tripled last year, which is a huge for a water company, and it's because there's a lot of use it or lose it mentality in uh, the sort of mid-range where people have budgets. They don't know what's going to happen to their inflated dollar tomorrow, so they're buying like crazy. And I think that we're going to see a lot of that in, in American business is an apparent boom, but they're still not as as big as the <laughs> – the boom in the degradation of the dollar, but that's a whole different podcast, right? <laughs> so meanwhile, we have um, uh, the, these companies that we talk to, by the time they put things out to bid, they've figured out their capital and they go, we got, we got this, just please just give us a bid. We continue to service those people. 
to find the people who are early stage, who are trying to solve that capital problem, we've, we're actually creating a whole new channel. And it relates to a decision we made about how to scale what we call water on demand, which is if we're going to finance these systems and put them on a service contract, if we then try and build and maintain those, it'll take us 20 years to scale up because of the amount of time it takes to build it. We'll have to like acquire companies and raise a ton of money and, and, you know, create presence in Washington state and all that stuff. Instead, we've chosen to just be the finance, the FinTech player and hand off the building and maintaining of it to a local regional water company, which makes us very popular because every loves a capital source. And so we say, Hey, uh, you know, let's see, we have a friend, you know, Acme Water Company in Atlanta, Georgia, and we say, uh, hey, guys, we've got, we've got a contract for you. It's a housing development in Alpharetta, and they want to connect, blah, 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 blah. Um, give us a bid, and we'll pay. I'm like, okay, sounds great. So what we've all, we're also learning is those people are a source of deal flow for us because they go, hey, uh, one company I spoke to and uh, that we have a close relationship uh, with – it's back a decade in uh, in Southern California. I was talking to them about this and they said, hey, we got a golf course in San Diego that they want to do that sewage skim thing. They got no capital for it. It's a $3 million project. And um, can you help? And I'm like, yeah, we can do it. So that's where these water companies, they're close to the ground. It's long before a company has gone to bid with a job and they're trying to figure out like, how can we do this. And that's where we get deal flow. So what's cool about this is we consider this kind of our supercharger network, the thing that makes a big barrier to entry for other companies, which is if we develop relationships with all these regional water companies where it's a mutual partnership, you know, uh, one, one uh, sort of interlocking, you know, um, mutual aid, then it, we've kind of created a relationship that's going to, you know, make it hard, harder for the next company to go in and try to do what we do. So, um, A, it's a solution to scaling because we're just doing the finance and the contract management. B, it's a source of deal flow from companies that are interested. And C, if you're talking, for example, about housing developments, there's a great co uh, developer network. It's, it's The real estate world is very um, well connected. People know each other very well. And already we started a network in that um, one particular uh, network is about 40 developers in northern Texas alone that would be interested in this, and we're trying to enter those. So develop, when, it, when it comes to communities, developers are wonderful. And so um, we, and then we have our conventional um, relationships in the water industry, which is um, consulting engineers. These are the people who, uh, if I'm a brewery and i, I got to figure something out, I'll find an engineer. Well, that engineer is interested in that contract happening because that's how he or she gets paid. And so they, we think, will also be bird dogs for deals. Long story short is I don't think we'll have a problem getting uh, deal flow if we have the capital. And the capital is flowing. People love the idea of being able to invest in a tangible water asset that produces. And they'll have, you know, when this thing matures, they'll have a dashboard and they'll be able to see how much water is flowing. And that's when we get to the later stage of crypto assets, which is a whole other game, probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but it's naturally, uh, it's perfect for a crypto token wrapper. Actually, that was what I was going to ask next is like, we've been talking about investing. We've been talking about raising money, um, you know, and talking about decentralizing things. And I, I know that there is, you've mentioned crypto with a water company. And I'm like, how do those two things interlock? And, and what do you, why do you feel the need to create your very own currency? Well, um, I, I, I was very excited in 2018. I remember in December, 2017, uh, going to some, uh, there was a Miami Bitcoin conference and there was a start engine um, conference in LA and all these. And I was very excited about the idea of, of a water coin, which we branded water chain at the time. And I spoke at some industry. In fact, D10 E, which is a decentralization conference. I spoke to them about decentralized water. Um, the problem with water chain twofold. Number one is we had that famous crypto winter that 
cut in in uh, later 2018, which is like, whoa. Um, but this, the more important problem, we could have kept going, that wasn't the issue, was that there was no stable price for water all over the place. Water pricing is totally political. Um, you know, the, the um, Michael Burry, the, you know, the famous big short where he says, the next thing I'm going to do is water. Well, he went into water. And the, the rest of that story is he learned it's highly politicized. And he basically gave up and went into farming as an indirect water user. And he's doing quite well. The point I'm making is that um, the, the whole water, legacy water thing is highly, um, it's very archaic. And it all depends on, you know, was your grandfather a water holder in, in the 1800s and that kind of stuff. So we we just found we could not get a stable price for water. Fast forward to today, now we're building a network of functional water systems that are paying by the gallon. So every single gallon of water is paid for. Well, now, hey, guess what? The second big thing that's good about the crypto industry is you no longer have to build a crypto from the ground up. You can build, you can, the NFT, non-fungible tokens, is a great thing because you just, you're sitting on top of an Ethereum standard. There's a market existing already, and all you got to do is package it as essentially a royalty-bearing NFT, which is, there's nothing science fiction about it. It's already being done. And bingo, you got yourself a digital bond that you can then transfer. And in that bond is embedded all the future revenue from your water royalties and I decided, you know what, I'm going to sell that to Cody and he's going to buy it for some discount to the net present value. Uh, and <clears throat> I got my cash. Cody's got the future of revenue. We move on. And that for investors will be very good because one of the problems with people investing in the 25 year revenue cycle is I don't know if I want to be around. I, I mean, I would be around in 25 years. <laughs> so what do I do? Well, this will create liquidity and ultimately we believe will create a market. Because the problem with water is there is no world market for water. Why? Water is local. It's too heavy, too cheap to send it from New York to Atlanta. So um, the people who have a, a water price problem in Northern California, they can't hedge their water risk with uh, options on Singapore water. Impossible. doesn't exist. But once a crypto world is created, we're – Let's say they're NFTs. I'm just throwing that out as a as a placeholder, right? It could be an asset, a straightforward asset coin just as easily. Um, then we start getting into exchangeability, and every one of these is paid for. Every gallon has money attached to it, so it's monetized. And so that makes it something that I think, you know, my personal opinion about crypto is that the crappy concept coins are going to be washed out, and we're going to be left with things that have – I'm, I'm excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are special cases. Everything else is really going to get, you know, get, you know, looked at like, well, is there something real there? Is there a business model or is there a real asset? And if it's not that, I think it's going to have a hard time. So we think it's going to be a very popular coin. We're not doing it right now, and there's very good reasons for it. Um, number one, it's just not part of the business cycle for us. It's, we can deliver dividends using ACH just fine. Not an issue. Um you know, uh, automated clearinghouse. It's painful because then people change their bank accounts and you got a poor customer sales rep trying to update things and it's kind of lame. But it does work, right? It, it's a workable system. Um, mortgage companies do it all the time. Uh, but, you know, that next step of um, being able to transfer just by changing addresses and all that, that's really exciting. What we're running into is the fact that the SEC does not love crypto. And we'd just as soon not create barriers. So we've explicitly excluded it from the current business plan of water on demand because we believe we've already made plans to file for a regulation, a offering for water on demand. Currently it's only accredited investors or non U S but we, you know, I'm a strong believer. Like I think it's a piece of crap that only the one percent can invest in interesting things. I think that's really stupid. So regulation A, which is the Jobs Act thing that was created for unaccredited investors, has become extremely viable, and we this summer will we expect to have an offering. And the last thing we want is for the SEC to go, what's this crypto? So 
we are choosing to defer it and actually make it a separate spinoff completely that will be funded using more conventional uh, crypto type. There's a whole crypto world for financing, which is separate. That's a long way to say that it's really tokenizable. It's, uh, we we want to create water communities in the crypto world, all that good stuff, but all in good time. We want to lay in the fundamental financing of water systems that you know um, everyday investors uh, like Cody and Justin can have access to. Awesome. Well, I love everything you're doing. I love the innovation. I'm sure, you know, these things are going to unfold with time and going to continue to just advance the technology. And I'm, I think that, you know, the crypto thing is such a good idea and commoditizing something like water is something that hasn't really been done before. For those who are like me and are really interested in what you're doing and all the companies that you're running, where are the best places for people to keep up with you, know what's going on, get invested and all that good stuff? I, n I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the um, as I say, if, if you're accredited, it's very simple. You go to originclear.com, and there's a big green button at the top right. You press that, and bingo, you'll find you'll find yourself talking to the amazing Ken Berenger, who is so smart and is co-creator of this water on demand with me. If you're unaccredited, you should still do that because it'll register you and. Um, you should start, everyone should start listening to our Thursday night uh, briefings. I Every week I do about a 45-minute uh, briefing of all the things that are happening. We are the most transparent public company in America, we believe. I, I basically tell it all within the legal bounds of what I can say. And as a result, people really, you know, over time, they really get to know everything we're thinking of. Uh, so... An easy way for people to sign up is to just type in their browser oc.gold slash CEO, oc.gold slash CEO, or just go to originclear.com and they'll get an invitation to go on the briefing. I would love to have people join it. We respond to all questions, uh, even even the tough ones. Uh, we will take it. What's up with your stock price? Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, we'll do it all. And so we love to... Uh, you know, there's a reason why we have a strong investor base and because they understand that um, we are responsive. If you receive one of my newsletters, when you hit reply, it comes into my inbox. And um, even though there's 30,000 people who receive it, I do answer your emails. And we pride ourselves on having that kind of relationship because I believe Main Street investors are the future of America. Um, decentralization of finance means that there's going to be more and more growth of everyday investors, even if they only plunk in $1,000. That's really, really healthy to have a, a very large amount of small investors. It makes for a very, very healthy future and a very healthy investor base. Riggs, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, there's, you know, That's the great thing about having this podcast. You learn something new every day, and this has been a really neat um, kind of deep dive into this water market. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your great questions. It's been fascinating. And, and I guess I just kind of let it all hang out, but that's, I guess you guys are good at that, right? <laughs>